And I believe you can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Um, folks in Zoom, can you hear me? Please say yes. Yes. Well, we lost your video feed. I know that. I'm working on it. I have to change accounts in order to be allowed to live stream. So what I'm going to ask is that we begin with the call to worship. And if you have that in your bulletin, please turn to it. Otherwise, you'll find it on your screens. This is adapted from a prayer by Rev. Abi. God, as we take this journey that draws us closer to you, God, as we go through the wilderness of our lives, God, as we walk through the potholes, the valleys, the pits of life, Keep us in your paths of love, mercy, and grace. Help us to remember we are not alone, but that we are journeying with our brother and sister travelers. Remind us once more that though you have gone ahead of us, you are also with us even now. And now this is the time in the service I know you can, uh, oh, hopefully now you can uh, see me somewhere on your screen. And yay, okay. <laughs> this is an exciting morning. And the whole theme of today is all about journey, which is what we were talking together about as a faith formation class. And we're going on a journey today, that is for sure. And it, it is the journey of what it means to gather as church across multiple ways of being, right? This platform of Zoom and being here in body, in person. Um, most of the time, it goes really smoothly. Occasionally, it's a little bit exciting. But all of the adventures make us who we are, and we do them together, and we kind of we try to laugh through as much of it as possible. So... Now is the time in the service when we share our prayers. And so I would ask if you have prayers of concern or celebration, I would appreciate hearing those, as would all of us. We're going to start in the sanctuary. Sue has the microphone. So if you have a prayer of concern, please raise your hand, and she'll bring the microphone to you. Linda's got one. My friend Eileen Pratty died yesterday from a very aggressive cancer mm -hmm. and prayers for her family. Tell, say her, your friends for Eileen. Eileen from Star, she died. We, we knew this was imminent, uh, but Eileen has passed away. Many of us were with her on Star Island this past fall. Uh, Mary Eads, who was the chaplain at Star Island, was in very close communication with the family through that whole journey, um, but we hold the life of Eileen in the light. We give thanks for the time that she was among us as a person, as my microphone falls off my face. We take her life seriously and let us focus and be present to the fact that people we love are on journeys that take them to the end of their lives. Um, and that we love them and we honor them. And so many of us are in a wilderness that includes grief. Grief for family, grief for friends. Sue has a concern. My friend Joshua, his mother is very ill. Please pray for Elizabeth. Pray for Elizabeth. Other prayers of concern here in the sanctuary. Prayers of concern in Zoom. If there's anybody in Zoom who wants to share, please go ahead and unmute and share with us. 
Do you see anybody, Sandy? I'm there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that Ray and I are starting a journey uh, together. Hospice has taken on um, our our case, and um, I'm going to just begin tomorrow with uh, seeing with two days a week and seeing where we're going to go with this. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sure could use some prayers for this journey. So for Ray and Arden, through the journey of hospice, which is also a journey that Meg's father is now beginning. Um, so we have a few people in our community right now who are in hospice. It's a different kind of a, an experience. And it is a privilege to be companions on the road with our family members, with our dear ones who are having this experience as well. Um, but it's, it's exhausting. It's full of uncertainty and grief and love and amazing moments. Other prayers of concern in Zumit. All right, no minute prayers in, in Zoom. Uh, also for one of our neighbors, uh, the church was contacted this morning and Tish, who is our deacon today, quickly made contact with an emergency response member of, of Jackson and uh, brought a neighbor named Connie to Jackson's attention because Connie had no heat or running water and she, there were a number of complicating circumstances. She needed a place to stay. So they're relocating her out of her home, which was no longer safe to some place where she will be safe until whatever's going on at her house can be resolved. Uh, so for quick thinking, you know, for the phone call of a neighbor who found out, Connie called a neighbor, the neighbor contacted the church, the church, uh, Tish was one of the people contacted and she contacted Emily, also a member of our church, but the emergency response coordinator for Jackson. And Emily had an immediate solution. So Connie's being taken care of. So that is a prayer of both uh, concern and gratitude. Concern because, for instance, we ran a cold shelter last weekend, and it was an amazing experiment, but we know it was a lot of work, too much work for the number of volunteers who did do it to repeat. And so the cold doesn't go away, but the circumstances in which our neighbors are living can, it is the same. The shelter called attention to something. We can't repeat it, but we hope that we will be able to ultimately change the ways that we respond to it. So for our neighbors who are living in sub-zero conditions, in tents and in cars without heat, we were able to help Connie this morning. There are dozens of people who maybe don't have some of that respite on a weekend. Um, May we find a way. Other prayers of concern. Prayers of gratitude, appreciation, celebration. Aha, I see Evie's got one in the back. So Sue's going to bring the microphone to Evie. She's in our sanctuary. My birthday is going to be tomorrow. Oh, Evie's birthday. How old are you going to be, Evie? Uh, ten. Ten. Double digits. This is a big milestone. You know, sometimes in the middle of prayers, we break into happy birthday songs. Is there anybody else that needs a happy birthday song in the middle of prayers? Is there anybody that's going to confess to an imminent birthday or one that just passed that you want us to include you in our happy birthdays? All right, well, um, let's see. Who's going to lead us in happy birthday? Alan, will you play happy birthday? That way we know we might stay on tune. We're going we're, we're gonna to do happy birthday in the middle of the prayers, and then we'll keep praying. Singing is praying. 
Double digits, Evie. You got an early, an early birthday song. That's pretty cool. And everybody in Zoom was also singing. Eventually, you'll be able to see that because I swear I'm going to get the um, screen going. Uh, and for anybody else that didn't admit that you just had a birthday or one's about to happen, consider that your song too. We know you want us to sing to you even if you didn't admit it. Other prayers of celebration. Anybody in Zoom have anything? Sandy, am I missing anything? Yes, I'd like to say that Bill's um, eye surgery was successful and he's back to work. So he's doing well. That's great. That's great. That's great news. I'm trying to do this elegantly, but it's not happening. Then I'm going to ask us to pray. Well, holy God, you are laughing because I thought I had everything figured out. And you are enjoying challenging what our expectations are and our plans might be and our agendas. And you are telling us that we are in your hands, that everything we thought we knew, everything that we expected we could put on a map or a schedule is in question. That we are a people designed to adapt to what is, to what may be, what is presently happening, what is our reality now, because despite everything that we knew or thought we knew, change is what happens in our lives. And you are the God that holds us in our change. You hold us in the change that is challenging for us. You hold us when our houses are freezing or we have no shelter and we have to call a neighbor and the neighbor has to call someone else and there is a way to help each other. And you are with us when there is no one to call, when there is no door that will open and make you warm and you are simply surviving through the cold night into the warmth of the day. You are the God that walks with us when hospice becomes our reality, when we are saying goodbye to this life or to the one that we love. You are the God of the snow. You are the God of the birthday song and the celebration. You are the one who is with us when we make our plans and draw our maps and think we know where we are and you are the one that stays with us in the wilderness. And even if we can't find something that we think is home, you offer us home because you are love and you will not leave us alone. Let us be present to your love. Let us receive your love. Let us find peace, dignity, comfort, clarity, strength, a renewed call to love, to the work of your hands for your people in this, your world, in our lives. We offer you now our silence. And we offer you our voices. And I ask that those of you who are in Zoom to unmute and join us as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, in heaven. hallowed be thy, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will, will, be, will done. be done on earth, on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. In heaven. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Day bread. And forgive and us our sins, our sins as we forgive those who sin against, against, against us. us. Lead us Lead not us into, temptation, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From evil. For, For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom power, and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, we once more raise our voices in song now that we're warmed up with our happy birthday song. We're going to sing, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant. We're going to visit again the first two verses of that song. If you're here in the sanctuary, it's page 374 in the red hymnal. I would ask you to stand if you are able for this song. And if you're in Zoom, the words will be on your screen. 374 verses 1 and 2. visiting this song every week and we will be adding and changing up verses. Please be seated if you wish. Um, this was a suggestion that came in from the deacons as a great theme song for the journeys that we are taking together. And Tish, it looks like, are you reading this scripture? Great. Okay. So Tish, when you come, wherever you read from, just stay sort of like at the end of the aisle and no closer otherwise you get feedback in the speakers there you go and you'll see the scripture on your screen if you are um this is a reading from mark chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 the temptation of jesus and the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. The second reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, the temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. 
Brothers and sisters, we ask that you pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, if anybody walked in the back door of the church this morning, you saw us sitting on the floor who, who walked in the back door of the church today. Okay. A lot of people in church came in through the back and you saw us. I don't know if you could tell what we were doing sitting on the floor, but we had maps out. And those maps were created by our youth. So... The challenge two weeks ago was to draw a map of your home and your neighborhood. How many of you have ever done that as an assignment, either yourself or with your, your children, grandchildren? Okay, Alan's done it. Sue's done it. Tish has done it. Calla and Evie worked on it this week. Um, was that the first time you'd ever done that, girls? No, you've done it before? Okay. And um, Gia was with us, and she quickly hand-drew in her sketchbook a map of her home and neighborhood. Sandy, you said you did it? No, you didn't? Okay. Um, in Zoom, is there anybody who's ever drawn a map of your house? Okay, no hands. I don't see anybody. Oh, wait. Cindy's, Cindy and Steve are both saying, oh, and Arden's saying, okay, I've got some takers. All right. I will try to get the image up, but every time I do that, I keep losing control, so it may or may not happen. We're trying to share uh, the image of all of you in Zoom with folks in the sanctuary. It's, everything's a little bit more challenging today. Today is the second story that appears in the scriptures about Christ's ministry as an adult. And if you recall... Last week, we put up maps and we showed you the Holy Land and we showed you a series of flagged places on that map that showed significant events, well, the locations of significant events in the life of Christ. And we will indeed be following that map over the course of the next several weeks leading up to Easter. And so, of course, it's important if you're going to map where someone goes on a journey to start with home. Kala, Evie, and Gia did that this morning. But they told me a story two weeks ago that I want to share with you so that we can begin to connect what it means to know where home is and what home is so that when you go away from home, and you change, and even if you're thinking about returning home, we have a sense of what it is we bring with us from home. The Battenfelder family heard a story on NPR, and it happened quite recently. It was in the news about a year ago. There is a young man named Lee, who had been drawing maps of his childhood home since he was four years old. And the reason that he drew the maps is that he was kidnapped. In China, for a long period of time, there was a one-child-per-family policy. And boy children were prioritized over girl children Sometimes a family couldn't conceive or have a boy child. And so for a while, there was a pattern of buying children. And Lee was purchased as a four-year-old away from the home where he had been raised. He was taken by somebody from that community and he was sold into a family that took very good care of him. He had everything a child could want except his name, his origins, his sense of self. 
And at four, he didn't know what his family name was. He didn't know the name of his village. China is a very large nation. But he could draw a map of his village. He could draw a map of the bridges that went over the river, the roads, the fields where the water buffalo grazed, and the mountains where the bamboo grew. He could draw it quite accurately. And he drew it over and over and over again for two and a half decades. When he was struggling, because of course, if you've been taken from your family at the age of four, there's trauma. And no matter how much the new family loves you, you are sometimes depressed or afraid or struggling. He would draw the map again every day. And just recently, in the last few years, social media has been successful at connecting people who have been taken from their families and reuniting them. And he saw a story like that, and he decided he would give it a whirl. And so he posted the images of his hand-drawn maps on social media and ask people to look at them and see if it looked familiar. And it created a buzz. And eventually the government heard about what was going on and government authorities actually got involved in trying to locate his original home and his birth parents. And they found his birth mother. They did a DNA test and they reconnected Lee with his mother. When he went back to the village, or when they investigated the village, the only thing missing was his actual home. It had been taken down. But the village was very accurate. He remembered it so closely. How many times he must have walked those roads, stopped to look at or interact with the buffalo, to be in the presence of the bamboo, to walk past the familiar shops and houses to the place where he was loved. And so the conversation that we had, Kala, Evie, Gia, Kate, and I this morning talked about what the map might represent to him. Remembrance of a place that he couldn't be anymore remembrance of something that was lost, which even if he went back to it as an adult, once he was reunited with his parents, was no longer the same because when has home, our childhood place of origin, ever looked the same when we went back to it? We are different. We're bigger. We have lived a lot. And the things that we thought we knew have changed in their appearance, in their orientation, their scale their meaning. But somehow we have carried this map with us through our lives, remembering something sacred or significant. What did it mean to him? It meant love. It meant a place where he had a name that he couldn't even remember, but an identity and a sense of belonging that had been stripped from him. And yes, he had a new family, but there was another family that he knew he belonged to a part of himself that he kept trying to find by drawing the map. And the map led him home. On the edges of the maps that were created either 3D as Kala's was with, um, you know, white squares for houses and green for all the wilderness or the trees and even some, you know, topographical stuff like one house was up on on an elevation and little red flags for important places or Gia's which was hand drawn with stars for the important parts of her life we talked about wilderness on the edge of Kala's map is Whitaker Woods 
which you could think of as being a wilderness. And we know that we live on the edge of amazing wilderness, the Gulf, the Great Gulf, the presidential range. How many stories have we heard about those who go hiking in these places and are lost? How many stories of first responders going out to help bring someone home safely or to recover those who didn't make it? But there are other kinds of wilderness. The young man, Lee, who drew that map was in a wilderness all its own. A wilderness of knowing who you are by one name and one context and knowing there's more. There's another part of the story that you can't connect. And then there's the wilderness that Christ walked out into, led or driven by the Spirit, depending on which story you read. This is a wilderness where Christ was not lost by accident, but went intentionally. And the girls also talked about the fact that wilderness doesn't have to be a bad place. It could be a challenging place. It might be a beautiful place. It might be a redemptive place. And for Christ, when he went out into that wilderness, what was he attempting? He'd been baptized. As one commentator that I was reading this week said, he'd just come from his baptism. And baptism is that immersion into relationship, connection, and belonging. It's water, it's spirit, but it is love and knowing that you belong and that you are beloved. It is all of that togetherness. Jesus had just been immersed in that experience. And then he goes out into the wilderness and he fasts, which is in of itself a spiritual practice. He was drinking water, but he wasn't eating. And David gave us some really great clarifying information, which is that in periods of training in the military, to create stress in the human body and on mind and emotion, the soldiers are not allowed to eat for a short period of time, they completely fast, and then they're rationed to one meal a day for an extended period of time. And meanwhile, they're making a lot of important decisions. There's a lot of exertion. There's a lot of stress going on. And the question for the people that have chosen to take this training or to be in this position is how will they do under stress? They will learn one hopes, to think clearly, to make decisions, to continue to function in the best way possible, though their bodies are stressed by lack of food and by the additional stimuli that are going on throughout that period. Two of the people in the five, three of the people in the five o'clock gathering have children who have also undergone this training. And the people that come back from this training aren't allowed to talk about it. But they bear the marks on their body. And what they have learned about themselves, about others that are in this training with them, they bear in their minds and in their hearts forever. Such training changes us. It hones us. It prepares us for what will come next. And this is the journey that Christ has gone on in the wilderness. It isn't one where he's lost and stumbling around. It's one where he's quite intentional about separating himself from that experience, that spirit of total connection and belonging that he just had through his baptism to this removal from everything and everyone except the spirit of God and himself. The beasts that are with him in the wilderness, companion or threat, maybe both. The temptations that unfold before him. How he leans in 
to the training that he received as a young man, as a child, going back to his Hebrew scriptures, because for every temptation that is offered, he says it is written. And when he says it is written, he's referring to Deuteronomy. And he's answering what has been offered that he should not accept. By going back to the law, the word, as it was handed down to his people as a guide, a way to ethically live your life and remain in good relationship with yourself and your God and your community. He brought that with him, all of his history, the teachings handed down for hundreds of years, the wisdom of his family, the love and support of his friends and kindred. He brought all of that with him into the wilderness, just as Lee, that young man, brought with him the map of his childhood into a place where he was challenged in so many ways. When we are challenged in this way, the idea is that we gain additional wisdom and insight. That when we return from that place of lost, being lost or wandering or being alone with ourselves and connecting more deeply with ourselves and our God and our surroundings, we have gained wisdom, we have gained insight, we have gained skills, and we know in a different way than we knew before we set foot into that wilderness who we are and what we are capable of doing, what our resources are, how far we can push ourselves. We may not know what comes next, but this part of the journey for Christ is that moment when he begins to prepare himself for all the stories that we will read that we already know. We already know the outcome or we think we do. Did he? Did he know? We don't know. He may have known. Some people teach us that he knew everything. Some teachers tell us that he certainly knew that he was risking huge hazard by placing himself in the path of the Roman government by choosing the companions that he chose, by continuing to challenge the status quo over and over again. Whether or not he knew what the outcome would be, he prepared himself for what he knew would be a very difficult journey. And it was a journey that isn't just metaphorical, it isn't a metaphorical wilderness that he walked into, and it would not be a metaphorical challenge that he lived. He lived it step by step, one footstep at a time, because he walked everywhere he went. He went with his friends, and he went in his human body, and he experienced it all with his skin and his mind and his heart, with his hands and his nerves, with every sense of his body, he smelled it, he saw it, he touched it, he tasted it, he heard it. He filtered it through the experience of his body. We can't separate ourselves from our bodies, though we are more than just our bodies. And so when we think about journey, it's not just a metaphor. It is real, and we are on a journey now. And as we said in prayer, people are at different places in their journeys, hospice, birthdays, new schools, new houses, no house, no home, new vocations and careers, Figuring out what it means to be together as a community that joins each other through Zoom as well as in body. 
We are on a journey together. And we draw upon that which we have been given. We carry the map of who we are with us. And our connection to it will change over time and it will get bigger and bigger and zoom further out and further out as our connections are more and more far flung across continents, across decades and generations, across so many different borders and paths. But what we need to know is that Christ has walked ahead of us every step of the way. And as one poet that we read this morning said, even if we're not sure where we are, God knows where. Think about that phrase, God knows where. We say it and we mean we don't know the location. Only God does. But Christ was living out that truth that God knows where. And God is with us. Even in the place where we feel the most lost, the most disconnected, God knows where. When Jesus came back from the wilderness and picked up his ministry, starting with the first miracle where he turned water into wine in Cana, he walked there. And he walked there with those he loved, his family and his friends, companions he hadn't even called to be with him yet. And he walked with the certainty that where he went, God knows where. God was with him, and as Christ walked through the world, God was with those people. And what our faith tells us is that God walks with us too. God knows where we are, whether we have a map or no map, whether we're in the wilderness or at home or someplace else. God knows where we are. And love somehow will meet us there. Whether it's a neighbor who picks up the phone and calls the emergency responders to bring you to a safe place. Or someone who sees you on the corner and gives you a ride to a shelter. Or however love shows up for you. God is with you on your journey. And we, we are with each other on this journey. And for each other, we are God and we are love. Thanks be to God. Please rise if you're able here in the sanctuary. And if not, if you're in Zoom, we're going to put up doxology for you. You might as well stay standing because we're going to move into In Christ There Is No East or West. That before they, we do that, just a quick reminder that this is the time in the service when we simply remind you that your faithful giving by envelope, by J, giving through jxncc.org, however you are doing it, it continues to make us healthy and vital. And it is a faithful way of being present to your community here 
and around the valley and through the world. And we thank you. We're going to sing all the verses of In Christ There Is No East or West. You'll find it on page 381 in your red hymnal, or you'll find the words on your screen. It's just a singing morning. Brothers and sisters, wherever you may walk, wherever you find yourselves on this journey, go with the map of love tattooed on your heart, ready on your lips, beneath your feet, all around you. Go with peace. Go with love. Go with home in your heart.